Howdy y'all. In this video I'm going to talk about whether or not President Obama should nominate Scalia's replacement. I ha I'm of two minds on this issue. On the one hand the President has the constitutional obligation to appoint the officers of the United States and the justices of the Supreme Court and the judges of such inferior courts as the Congress will have from time to time uh, established. On the other hand, President Obama has spent the last eight years ignoring large parts of the Constitution and why should this issue be any different? Um, so, the, the obligation to appoint is not simply the obligation to appoint. There are other words in that sentence, and it is the obligation to appoint by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. The President has ignored the advice of the consent, uh, I'm sorry, the advice of the Senate. It should not be surprising that they will refuse to give him consent, and that he's going to complain they're not giving him the consent that he wants. That's the consequence of not uh, taking their advice. Now, I don't like it when nominees aren't given a hearing, or aren't given a, an up and down vote after the hearings, I should say, when they just sit in committee and wait. Those are lower federal court judges, and the advice there is general. I mean, it's not spoken, but the general advice is, President, use your best advice, send them over, and we'll either do something with them or not, and that's just kind of how the game goes. I think they should all get a vote, provided the, the President follows the advice, which is essentially send over whoever you think is qualified, and then once they do that and they have the, the short hearings, they should uh, give a straight up or down vote, and the person should know whether or not they get the job or don't get the job. Uh, on the Supreme Court, the advice is not just send over whoever you think will work, and then we'll deal with it when it gets here. It is uh, the, the reason that is the advice on the lower federal court judges is because their mistakes can be corrected by an appellate, ju uh, an appellate court or by the Supreme Court over the, that uh, first appellate court. With the Supreme Court, there is no revision, but for a new court, you know, the, the court changes its mind or a justice changes, or constitutional amendment on constitutional issues. So the advice here is that it has to be someone who we like, in addition to being generally qualified to be a jurist. Um, so the president could follow, uh, consistent with the, the Senate's um, view on this, he could nominate someone who would get Senate approval. But of course the president isn't going to nominate someone who could get Senate approval, because the president is not going to nominate someone who the Republicans will like. Uh, there's a big disagreement between progressives and, and the Republicans on, say, for example, the role of the Second Amendment. The progressives think that it plays no role, it's completely superfluous, and you can entirely ignore it. And indeed, this is the view of Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor, who sat in their hearings and said that D.C. against Heller, which held that there is a fundamental right, uh, it adheres in the individual, uh, they said this is settled constitutional law, it is entitled to all the respect of any constitutional decision of the Supreme Court of the United States, they get, a, they get appointed, and the moment that they get, uh, they get on the court, the first opportunity they have to repudiate that and run away from it and say, huh, psych, they did that. That was the uh, McDonald against Chicago decision where they said, well, you know, whatever the right is, no matter how fundamental it is, the states don't have to respect it at all. The states can categorically ban anything that they should like. They don't have to give any justification for it. It just simply is not a right of the citizens of the states. So states... Go free, do whatever you want, get jiggy with it. Judge, judge Garland, who the president has nominated, is going to be a judge, likely to be a judge, in that mold. And uh, the reason for this is quite simple. He has two decisions that affect the Second Amendment uh, when, from when he was on the D.C. Circuit. So there was a panel of the D.C. Circuit that held uh, challengers uh, to the um, D.C. gun law, uh, lack standing under some extraordinarily stringent standard. A judge dissented. And uh, because the plaintiffs wished, who wished to obtain the guns uh, and risk prosecution if they did so, did have a cognizable injury. Anyway, so the plaintiffs asked the D.C. Circuit to rehear the case, and even the judge who wrote the opinion denying them standing said that the panel should review, I'm sorry, in, on bank, they should review the, uh, the panel's decision. John Roberts, who was then a judge, not the, not the justice, uh, joined the call for the rehearing. And Judge Garland said, no, that decision should stand. Those people should be denied even the right to have a hearing in court that they are injured parties, that they have a right at all. He said, no, they'd, we shouldn't review that. And then uh, an, a, another challenge came up, and it was on the, uh, the opposite way. This is Parker against the District of Columbia. A panel held that the plaintiff did have standing, and that the Second Amendment does protect an individual right to keep and bear arms, and that the handgun ban did violate this right, uh, the District of Columbia uh, had argued that the amendment only protected a collective right, the states, and blah, 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 blah. And just Judge Garland said that we should, uh, we should review that because we should look at whether or not this panel is right in saying that there is such a right uh, of, of a citizen 
to his firearms. So there's that. Now, I don't agree with the Republicans who say, uh, well, I agree that the voters should decide this issue, but I disagree about the temporal aspects of the particular argument they raise. They say it's the next set of voters for the next election, and I say that that's not how elections work. If people are elected into office to handle whatever happens in that, uh, sub, you know, within the jurisdiction of that office during the period of time for which they were elected. The, president Obama is, is the president, um, and this Senate is the Senate. These people were put there by the voters to, to handle such issues as they arise within that term. The president doesn't stop being the president a year before he's not president anymore. He's president for the whole term. Well, I mean, unless he dies or is in peace or something, but you know what I'm saying. So he's president the whole while. It is his obligation to seek the advice of, of the Senate and to follow, you know, listen to that advice and then to make a decision and then ask, ask for the consent of the Senate. It is the obligation of the Senate to give that advice and then to make a, a judgment about whether or not to give uh, consent. This is not about, well, let the next set of voters decide this. I mean, the next set of voters are likely to decide this because the president refuses to listen to their advice and they in turn won't give consent. But this rhetoric about letting the voters decide is just nonsense. The voters have decided. They elected you to be the senators and they elected him to be the president. The Senate is the check on the president. The president is not free to appoint officers willy-nilly. He must this power is split between the Senate and the President. If they don't agree, the person doesn't be, doesn't get the office. They just don't become, they just don't get uh, put into that office. They don't get the appointment. It's that that simple. And on the important uh, constitutional offices like the, the Supreme Court, the cabinet secretaries, and whatnot, uh, the uh, the Senate is not shy about giving advice to the President about what they will and won't accept. Presidents who are strong don't have to listen to that quite as much because you know they will uh, their party will be in power and they can pretty much uh, they have a much freer hand to do what they want president obama is not a strong president he's a weak president i don't mean anything derisive by that but he his party is not the majority in the senate and that's a that weakens the president uh and it says last year and presidents and their you know the lame duck presidents aren't typically uh, as strong as presidents who have a lot of time left it just happens to be the way it works out and because he's not a strong president, he doesn't have a free hand to uh, say, I'm not going to listen to this piece of your advice, but I'll consider this other piece of your advice. He has to take their advice. He refuses to take their advice. He won't take their advice. He re la, 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 la. I can't hear you. And then he wants to say, I'm going to nominate whoever I want, no matter how uh, you know, hostile to the rights that you senators care about. I'm going to nominate that person, and I'm going to try to pretend as though it's your fault for not giving me a hearing. No, look, Mr. President, listen to their advice. Find a nominee who uh, likes all the Constitution, not just the parts you like, or don't bother nominating someone because we won't, be, we, won't, we won't be entertaining it, which is the right of the Senate to do. But the Republicans should drop this nonsense about the voters uh, deciding this. The voters have decided it. That's why you were elected. Do your job. Stand up and say, we are making a decision uh, that because the President refuses to heed our advice, we refuse to grant consent. And on the fear that uh, we can't, we can't uh, have a Supreme Court operating without... You know, with this one justice missing, nonsense. Now, the, any six of the justices constitute a quorum, and any uh, evenly decided decisions uh, make no law. Uh, it is not essential that you have an odd number. It just means that in cases where you have a majority, you have a majority, and that sets law. In cases where it's evenly divided, the lower court opinion stands, and it makes no law. It just stands. It can be reviewed uh, by the next one. If it were really the case that the Supreme Court couldn't function without all nine justices, it would require nine justices to constitute a quorum, but it doesn't, it only requires six. So, so long as we have a quorum, we have a constitutionally adequate Supreme Court, and there is no injury to the Constitution, the, the Republic is not in peril, and the Senate is perfectly well within its rights to stick its, you know, dig its heels in and say, no, Mr. President, you will heed our advice, or you will be absent a nominee, and he's going to be absent a nominee because the President's going, I don't have to listen to you, and this is just how, this is the sausage of politics. All right, so what I have to say about that. Have a great day.